There is absolutely nothing in the context of our reading today that doesn't contrast with Isaiah's call before God and Jonah's call before God that we just covered last week. And if you know anything about Jonah, if you listened last week or need to be caught up on it, Jonah was someone who my grandpa would like to say was on his high horse. Uh, this is someone who just has the moral high ground. This is someone who just knows that he has something on someone else and he's going to hang on to it. He is not going to seek forgiveness. He is not going to forgive. And even before God kind of stands defiant, not wanting to do what God has called him to do, to the point where he tries to run away and, and you know, he's tossed off the boat, fish swallows, barfs him up on the shore. God still has to goad him to do what he needs to do. And as he goes into the town of Nineveh, to the Ninevites, I'm sure he did a really bang-up job of, of proclaiming the message of God. I can just see him whispering, like, repent, repent, you know, just trying not to do a good job of it. And yet the city turns, and God's will is done. That is in complete contrast to what we're covering today. We're going to take a look at the call of Isaiah, and then also I really want to draw out of it, there's so much there, I really want to draw out of it more about how God calls all of us, sort of the call of God and what that might look like. <coughs> and so let's get into it. We read today from Isaiah chapter 6, and so some people would think, well, normally how this works in the Old Testament is this. Chapter 1, in the first paragraph, you see something happening, and God calls up a prophet, calls up a voice to be given to His people, and it starts right out of the gate. Well, in this case, it's all the way into the sixth chapter that Isaiah gets this vision, gets this call. So what in the world's happening before then? Well, what we're seeing is actually five chapters of laments as Isaiah looks on his people, looks at who they are, looks at how deplorable their lives have been, and, and just sees what's happening to the people of God. Uh, they had split up, of course, at this point into two kingdoms. You have a northern and a southern kingdom. You have the uh, sort of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea was split up. And the northern kingdom just has a reputation of disobeying God. And they've had so many kings, it's hard to even keep count. But now, even the southern parts of God's people are turned away, are doing despicable things. And so, Isaiah had observed uh, quite a bit of this activity, and in those first chapters, he notices this rebellious nation. He sees people abandoning God's ways. He sees the arrogance of the men. He hears and can just feel the judgment that's about to come down on, on Jerusalem and Judea. Matter of fact, he uses this from a sort of a vision or a voice from God that this vineyard that had been lush was about to become a wasteland. And then he goes on to these deep woes, these disappointments um, that rounds out chapter 5. And so Isaiah is noticing all of this as writing it down. And then in chapter 6, there comes this point that we catch up on our readings today. In the year of King Uzziah, the, the year that he died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him were seraphims, each with six wings, with two wings that covered their faces, two that covered their feet, and two that allowed them to fly. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple filled with smoke. You know, Isaiah, so quick in the first five chapters to point out the flaws in the people around them, to bring out the flaws of the nation in which he was living in, has now quickly come before the Lord through this vision, and things are about to change quite a bit for Isaiah. And it's important as we take a look at this call, just how amazing this vision must have been. I mean, they didn't have internet. <clears throat> they didn't have, 
you know, TV. They hadn't seen a Godzilla film and CGI and all these other things. So not only is this incredibly wondrous for us today, for Isaiah it would have been absolutely overwhelming that the Lord would come into His presence. And this is where I like to start our understanding of the call process, sort of how is God calling everyone? What does this call look like? And in much of the Old Testament, for sure, a call from God often comes with sort of three characteristics to start off with. It starts with a crisis, then there's a common tradition, and then there's a message from God. Now, we, we heard about this crisis as we started, the, these people turning away the deplorable behavior that he was seeing in, in his own people. The common tradition, well, uh, you need to be able to speak the language, you need to know a little bit about the people in order to deliver. So it's very important, and, and God does this. He finds people that, that at least have some knowledge and firsthand experience to be able to deliver the message. So that's important. But what was the message? This is where most churches and our scriptures usually stop when we're preaching it. But it's really important to continue so that we can hear what this message is, because unlike Jonah, who is delivering a, a message of repentance and that God would forgive them and things would be good if they did, this is something quite different. The message went like this. He said to Isaiah, go and tell this people be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Hmm? Turn and be healed. Wow, that's, that's pretty rough, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're going before God and, and there's a crisis, I want to hear how this is going like, to work out. And, and this comes out kind of uh, strong, really. How would you like to be the person to deliver that message to a nation? You know, we're going to callous you. We're going to wear you out. We're going to put you down. You know, maybe in a bad sermon I get to see some of that sometimes in people. But this is, this is something incredible totally different. And so I don't blame Isaiah for turning to God and go, um, how long am I going to have to say this, oh Lord? You know, how long is this mess? When do we get to the good stuff? When do we hear about like the recovery? When do we hear about the good? Yeah, well, when's this going to come out? When, when's this crisis going to end? And the Lord answered, until the cities lie ruined and, with, and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. I, I, ouch, I guess. <laughs> really? You want me to deliver that message, huh? And, and how long am I supposed to deliver this? See, this is something very important for us to know. We discover that Isaiah had this terribly difficult task ahead of him, if he accepted God's call, of course. And we see with, with Jonah, if you don't, you know, when God gives you a call, it's going to be done. Because he would be preaching this, this message, right, to God's displeasure and the coming destruction of their own people, that's kind of hard to do. And so, as part of our understanding of what a call really is, there's something important for us to know. Yes, there's a crisis and there's a common tradition and a message, but it is based on the journey, not the results. It's something very important. Now, again, Jonah didn't quite get this. The book of Jonah is really about Jonah and his relationship with God. Jonah was upset that he would forgive these people that had abused him for years, maybe even generations, his people, and he was going to hold on to that. He was not going to forgive these people. He was not going to seek forgiveness himself. He was in the right. Hmm. And if you go through Jonah, it doesn't look like he learned anything on that journey. But God, time and time again, would go to Jonah and say, hey, are you really sure you want a God that's wrathful and vengeance? Don't you want a God that has mercy and compassion? Because who needs it more than anyone in the story? Jonah. 
He needed it more than anyone else. And yet through the whole thing, he stays obstinate, stays on his high horse. He refuses to seek forgiveness for himself or give any of it away. And the only miserable person in the whole story really is Jonah. Because the people hear the call, they turn, they're celebrating. And Jonah, the story ends with him pouting, staying on his high horse. Well, well then now here's Isaiah. Again, it's about this journey that we do personally as God loosens our grip on this world. As we work with God, this seems to happen. But he is in charge of the results. He is in charge of the message. And so even though Isaiah had this difficult task in front of him, the results were not his to worry about or to take control of. His job was just to deliver the message before God. And we see when he gets into that great image, so we see these seraphims, we see the Lord's presence, we see this great hall, and how difficult it was for Isaiah to describe all this. I mean, he's trying to use our language and our senses to describe this heavenly moment. It's difficult. And so Isaiah cries out as he personally is going to be affected through this journey. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He immediately realizes before the Lord that as he has been viewing the other people and making these comments, he is just as sinful he is just as much part of these people. He is part of the mix more than anyone else. If you look at Jonah's view of himself before the Lord, you see this high horse, I'm, I just have the better view. I knew better than to do that with you, Lord. I knew you'd forgive him attitude. Never ask for forgiveness. But Isaiah sees his position before the Lord differently, right? Right? Huge. Isaiah knew that he was unclean, that he was just as in it as everyone else, that he just had his own different flaws, that it was all bundled in, that we are all sinners, and so we are all in it together. Woe is me, says Isaiah. But God prepared a cleansing for him. Before he ever dealt with the sawdust in Isaiah's eye, or sorry, the sawdust in all the people's eyes, Isaiah needed to take care of the plank that was in his. Before he would judge, he would need to get forgiven. Before, right, he could forgive, he would need the Lord to forgive him first. He needed to deal with his own planks, and he knew it right away. What a huge difference than what we just looked at last week. He needed forgiveness. And so, Isaiah 6 continues, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. All that work God was trying to bring Jonah to this same place just never happened. But with Isaiah in the presence of the Lord, he knew who he was. He needed that forgiveness. And so God had prepared this for him and forgave him. And in this, this moment of forgiveness and this whole scene that's being played out, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Now, this is before he knew what that message was going to be, but who shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. A much different story this week, isn't it? One of the uh, running jokes of the pastoral staff is a comment that was always made when George Meegard, one of the pastors of our past, when this would ever come up, he would say, here I am, send Kip. Here I am, send somebody else, right? But in this case, he's saying me, send me, right? And so we read this Romans passage that talks about how 
your journey is affected most of anyone. As you seek your own forgiveness, as you go before the Lord, before we judge, before we do anything, how that changes our own lives. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's exactly how it works. Over time, as you work with the Lord, you learn kind of how He operates, how He works in your life. You begin to to see these blessings swirling around you, just as Isaiah is about to do. But again, thank goodness it's about the journey, because remember the results again. (laughs) Yeah, God, how long am I going to have to say this stuff to the people? Yeah, until everything is laid waste. So I would rather hold on to the journey than the result in this case, without a doubt. But what I don't want you to think is that a call from God is this torturous sort of tear us apart, sort of overwhelming, earth-shattering stuff. The call of God, our general call as all Christians, is in our everyday ordinary, without question, right? The call of God often is lived out in the everyday ordinary spaces of our life. It starts at the home, then it leaks over into the neighborhoods, and then it goes out into our larger community and to the world. Our general call as Christians is to live out the call of God as God delivers His Word. He fulfills His Word in our presence, and He does this through us without a doubt. I uh, am reminded of Matthew 25 and how as Jesus is talking about all this, just this, this wonderfulness of Yes, there are these special calls in our life, and every one of you have them, where God is going to really kind of move you back and forth and we wrestle. But there's this everyday presence of God in our world. And he talks about this a little. For I was hungry, says the king, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. These everyday ordinary occurrences or or happenstances throughout our week, how important they are. And they said, Lord, we didn't do any of this for you. And his reply was, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And so, as God calls Isaiah, and how different that is than, than Jonah. Luckily, he works with both, right? If God can work with such a, a tough-minded, high-horse person like Jonah, maybe I got a chance. But even as he works through these special calls in our life, there's this everyday ordinary I don't want you to lose track of or lose focus on that we live throughout our lives as well. Now, there's certainly a crisis here. There's a common tradition. There's a message. This is about Isaiah's journey with the Lord just as much as it was with Jonah about a certain result that God has chosen. Um, We we, we want to always remember this. But the last real bit I want to talk about the call of God is this. It is beyond our skills or resources, so we must trust to become interdependent. I'm going to be honest with you because this is coming just from my own experiences. Oftentimes, these special calls or or God is moving us toward is way over our heads. Most of the projects I work on as the executive pastor here at the church are things we've never done before or we have really large difficulties with or people don't know what to do with it or there are massive challenges or certainly huge ambitions. That is sort of my area. And so when you live in those areas, you're over your head almost all the time. I am over my head constantly and I need this breathing straw, you know, I I guess a lot of the time just to keep the air going. And I've learned over time that even though I don't exactly know how we're going to get there, or how we're all going to get there. But I know that God is moving us there because we have this board and we have you and we have all the others that know we need to be there. 
I don't know how to cross some of these huge caverns and rivers that we're about to face. I just don't. And so I've learned to say, we'll deal with it when we get there. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. What do we need to do now? What do we need to do? And, and slowly working with God, I've had to learn to trust Him. Isaiah is going to have to trust God that what he's about to do will end in a result that's good. And, and these calls cause us to, to loosen our grip on the need we have of ourselves, to loosen our grip on our world and sink deeper into Him, right? And we learn to trust Him, and we're going to have to trust the people around us because God has never issued a call to anyone on earth that didn't require help from other people. You are not alone. No matter what your mission is, no matter what your cause is, no matter what your call, you are not alone. You have God, Son, Holy Spirit in the max, but you also have these people around you. We have the people watching. We have our community. You're all in it together. And God purposely built our world to be interdependent. You can't do it alone. Boy, do we rely on so many others. Isaiah knew right away that he was over his head, didn't he? Right? <laughs> Woe is me. <laughs> what have I got myself into here? Woe is me. He knew immediately that he was over his head. And then when he asked how long this message had to take, <laughs> yikes, right? It's, it's going to need a lot of support. He's going to need a lot of help to make all this happen. And the disciples that would follow Jesus sort of started in the same way. They really didn't have a clue when they came on board, when God was calling them. You see in Matthew chapter 4, them just a little snapshot, and I'm, I'm one of those who believe that, yes, they did stop and follow Jesus. And it says that as Jesus was walking, looking for those disciples to follow, he came across two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net to the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Do you believe for one second they knew what they were getting into? Do you believe for one second they knew what they were going to see, what they were going to be a part of, what the result of all of this would be? Do you think? I don't think at all. Though they followed, there's this a massive amount of trust and interdependence that's required. And so, we all are, are tied and built together. We're all one because we've fallen, and we're all kind of intertwined together because that's just how Christ built us. And over a lifetime, we learn to loosen our grip and sink. Sink. Hmm? Well, understanding who we are before our righteous and holy God gives us a reverence for all life, and especially for our God and a humble attitude. We then can ask for and give forgiveness because when, you, when you're high-horsed like Jonah was, he had no interest in asking for forgiveness and no interest in forgiving others. But there is this presence to the Lord over time where we begin to understand who we are, who He is, as we sink deeper and we understand the value of forgiveness. We understand what that means a little better, how dependent we are on Him for this. And greater than the coal that we read about today, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to offer us forgiveness and establish this new relationship with us. And it's a wonderful thing, this relationship, because without it, we wouldn't be able to see. Just like it says in Isaiah, our eyes would not be able to see, our ears would not be able to hear, our, our mouths would not be able to taste. We would not be able to, to understand all these blessings God has swirling around us and working with us. It is this relationship through repentance and forgiveness and learning and prayer and reading, and, and it's this ebb and flow over our lifetime that builds in us. We don't really get better. We just sink deeper into Christ. Hmm? It is through a relationship with Jesus that our eyes are opened to how God has been active in our lives and allows us to be part of God's will. 
We begin to see more. We begin to sense. We begin to understand how God works in our life, and we begin to, to know when He's moving us, when our part has come. And it's exciting that that is part of our world and our lives. We thank Him for it. I'd like to end on three questions is all today. Just three. How has God shown Himself to you? Truly, God is with you. He is in this world. Where has He shown Himself to you? And how have you responded or not responded to it? It's an interesting thought. And finally, are you working through God's plan for your life right now? Are you wrestling? Know that you are not alone again and that we are all bound in it together to help each other as we need all the help we can get. Lord, we just thank Jesus Christ that He has brought us forgiveness, and then out of that great abundance in our life, we can then forgive others. Hmm. That is why in the Lord's Prayer it focuses so much on forgiveness. If you're going to live in this world, you're going to have to learn how to do it. <laughs> and so we thank the Lord for this gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the Lord's Prayer. This is, if anything, a framework of how God is teaching us how to live until we are fully with Him someday, to be in line with His will first, to understand what His calling is for our life than to ask and seek those resources around us that God is providing to make that call work. And then he switches over again into, okay, I need you to work with other people, so you're going to have to seek forgiveness, get that plank out of your eye, and then learn how to forgive the sawdust and others. Really start to work that out. And it's a beautiful guide for our life. So why don't we join together today in our Lord's Prayer. And, and what makes this prayer so awesome is that we can say it without thinking. What makes this prayer difficult is because we can say it without thinking. So take that time and just think through what Isaiah went through, the journey, and what God is asking of us, and what we are asking for in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen.